Okay, everyone. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, so this is our uh, Sharing Science on World Oceans Day webinar. Uh, I am Shane. I'm one of those names up there. Um, so briefly, just some housekeeping things before we get started. Anytime throughout the webinar, if anyone has a question, we'll answer everything at the end. But you can uh, ask a question by typing it into um, on the right side or wherever the go to webinar uh, little box thing is. There's a questions box. And so you can type the question into that box. We'll be tracking questions throughout. Um, and then we'll answer uh, some or whatever we can get to during the webinar. And then extra ones we can follow up later. We'll send you a follow up email um, afterwards with a link to the recording of the webinar. And then some relevant links that our presenters are going to be talking about today. Uh, so, briefly, um, before we kind of get into the bulk of it, uh, we are part of AGU's Sharing Science Program. So, AGU is the American Geophysical Union, for those of you who are unaware. Um, we are a big Earth and Space Science Society, 60,000 plus uh, members, 140 some countries around the world. And the Sharing Science Program is for, our whole goal is to teach scientists how to um, more effectively communicate their science or science in general to literally any audience. And so we provide skills and tools and resources and whatever basically folks might need to be better communicators, to communicate to literally anyone of their choosing. We do this through a bunch of different ways. Um, we're on a web webinar right now, but there's also workshops. Um, we have a ton of online resources at our website. We have a really active Twitter account. Um, and we also provide hands-on support. So if you're interested in sharing science, uh, there'll be a, some slides at the end as well to follow up with us directly. We are, so my name is Shane Hamlin. I am a core part of the sharing science program. Uh, the picture on your left is my colleague, Olivia Ambrosio, who's also in the room. Say hi, Olivia. Hello. <laughs> uh, we are going through us pretty quickly because we're not the focus of this webinar. Um, and then also our colleague, Kelly McCarthy, who's part of HU Centennial Program. You say hi, Kelly. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and then our experts for today are going to be uh, Don Wright and Tashiana Osborne, and they'll introduce themselves a little bit later in their sections um, because they can do themselves more justice than I would be able to do. So the last kind of HU housekeeping thing is this is part of our AGU Centennial Year Celebration, uh, um, our line of programming. So Kelly's briefly going to talk about what AGU Centennial is. Sure. Thanks, Shane. Um, so this year we are celebrating AGU Centennial, so 100 years of advancing Earth and space science. Um, and around that, we're focusing on using this as a propellant to broaden and deepen engagement within and outside of the Earth and space science community. Um, so, so we're excited kind of for, to, for today's uh, workshop to, to get exactly to that point. Um, we have a lot of different uh, programs going on that help us to amplify the work that all of you do, um, including a, a storytelling initiative called AGU Narratives. Um, we have grants where we're funding outreach and engagement activities called Celebrate 100 Grants. Um, and we've got a variety of social media um, campaigns, uh, including 100 Facts and Figures, um, which take uh, important discoveries in Earth and Space Science um, and send them out via social media um, in digestible graphics made um, uh, based on submissions by some of our members. Um, and we're also uh, focusing on celebrating um, and leveraging uh, the community around internationally established science days like World Oceans Day, which is why we're excited to kind of talk about um, ways that, that you all can communicate your science and share your work um, around uh, this upcoming day in June. Um, you can learn more about all of those programs at centennial.agu.org, and you can always ask us any additional questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And uh, and I mentioned this beginning, but just to reiterate, uh, this is going to be recorded. We'll have a recording sent to all of you who registered. Um, and again, lots of follow-up information as well. So if you missed something and we don't get to it in the questions, uh, there'll be an opportunity to get to it later. We will we'll definitely be able to answer anything. So that's uh, enough of us. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Don. So go ahead, Don. Okay, thanks, Shane. 
My name is Dawn Wright. Uh, I am a proud member of the American Geophysical Union and, and have been very pleased to be working with uh, AGU Sharing Science over the last couple of years. I am currently the chief scientist of ESRI, or the Environmental Systems Research Institute, which is a uh, mapping geographic information systems and geospatial data science company. I'm also uh, on the faculty at Oregon State University where I was a professor of geography and oceanography for about 17 years and uh, continue to, to work with that university. So what I'd like to do is to give you a perspective from someone who is fairly old. And let me just, uh, I'm just working with the responsiveness of the uh, clicker here. Shane, can you put me back one slide, please? So uh, I've been working on, yeah, we can, we're gonna go forward one. Okay, great, thank you. So I've been working uh, with uh, social media and with sharing science probably for about 10 years now. So I wanted to spend just a few minutes uh, talking about uh, different things that have worked uh, for me on Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, I won't talk very much about Flickr, but uh, I, I also really enjoy Flickr and, and also Wakelet. Uh, and social media is really this broad universe of communities, of ecosystems, and so forth. And I'm sure uh, many of you are feeling uh, a bit overwhelmed by it all, but it, I found it to be uh, just a fantastic uh, medium for, for sharing our science, and particularly uh, through uh, AGU's program. So let me just quickly go through a couple of tips and tricks and some of the things that have happened to me and then uh, I will be very, very pleased to pass off to Tashiana who will give you a perspective from an er a more of an early career scientist viewpoint. So let me see if I can click through. So why and for whom? For many of us who are older, uh, senior scientists who have been teaching for a while uh, on faculty or have been in organizations for quite some time. Uh, social media kind of hit us uh, broadsided. We were wondering, what in the world is this? Why should I use this? Um, how might I use it effectively? Is it really going to uh, reach the audiences that I want to reach? Is it uh, is it really substantive beyond sharing pictures of cats and dogs and, and such uh, on the internet? Uh, how might I use this? So uh, I had the uh, great pleasure and honor of going through some specific science communication training uh, a few years ago with Compass Science Communication Incorporated. And I would highly recommend uh, Compass if you're looking for, for more uh, rigorous training. Uh, have Compass in your toolbox along with the AGU sharing science programs and activities, you will be set for the 21st century. One of the things I learned from Compass is that one of the reasons why we participate in social media is because of our identity. It's a way that we can identify with our fellow scientists. Uh, we can uh, identify uh, with our students, uh, with our families, with our local communities. And so that's one of the first things that drew me into to social media. This is one of the pages that I use that has a, a little dashboard of all the different social media platforms uh, that, I'm, that I'm involved in uh, right now. So identity is one major reason. Another one is teaching. For those of us who are still in the classroom, uh, these various social media platforms are absolutely fantastic uh, for teaching if used properly. And one article that I'd like to share along those lines is by Andrew Revkin. He writes for, for various outlets. This is a New York Times article, but he's currently a strategist for National Geographic. And this is a, a delightful article on birds, Twitter, and teaching. It came out a few years ago, but the link is in the lower left. And I'd really encourage you to take a look at it because it talks about uh, one example where uh, an instructor, a professor in the classroom, uh, used Twitter really, really well in terms of passing on knowledge. Another reason why we use uh, social media, 
and I'm still waiting for this to, okay, there we go, is for outreach. And this is a primary uh, modicum that I use now uh, in terms of getting the word out about the different types of science that I'm involved in, uh, about social issues, uh, about uh, certain aspects of my life, so that people understand that there's more to a scientist than just being someone who's locked up in a lab in the ivory tower or someone who wears a, a white lab coat and doesn't care much about the world outside of the one species they're, they're studying and so forth. Uh, there's a whole richness to the scientific world and to the work that we're doing. And this is a poster that was presented at AGU uh, a while back that talks about participation in social media as academic service. We do research, we do teaching, but the service component of our lives, uh, I hope for, for most of us now, is about sharing our science. And this was also presented at AGU as a story map, uh, which we can talk about a little later, but a story map is a wonderful uh, medium for uh, sharing our science, uh, particularly if we are using maps and other types of geospatial uh, data. One of the things that I really like about uh, these types of uh, maps or these ways of sharing is that we can share the URL to that map or to that story very easily on social media. And here I'm using uh, a shortened URL to share it out so that people can understand what it is and get to it. And also many of these ways of sharing now are being uh, cited or are being labeled with digital object identifiers like papers, uh, like other types of, of media. So that's a new, a nice new development as well. In terms of storytelling, uh, it really is, you, you'll hear a lot about storytelling from the AGU Sharing Sciences team. Uh, we've already heard about how it's gonna play an important part in the AGU Centennial. And it really is, I think, a wonderful and growing movement among, among researchers and educators. And this is yet another story map uh, that I used as a poster at AGU. This was something that was a three or four by six poster. It was also on an iPad or on a laptop so that I could go through the various maps with people uh, down on the AGU uh, poster exhibit area. I wanted to just very, very quickly, I'm um, about halfway through my time, so I wanted to talk just a, a, a bit about technology, some of, uh, some of the tips that I've learned over the years about uh, technologies that we use in social media, and also about some of the, the best practices, some of the ways that we can really amplify the message that we're trying to get across, and things to think about as you prepare for World Oceans Day next month. So let me go through these uh, very quickly. Uh, the headings will be repeated so that you can uh, keep up with what I'm showing you here. So I've already showed you one uh, technology tip, which is to shorten some of the URLs that you might use. Uh, in our, with our technology at Esri, our maps end up having these very, very long URLs because they are associated with uh, custom uh, identifiers that actually help people to find our maps on ArcGIS Online. But you can use any number of URL shorteners so that you're not sharing something that is 40 or 50 characters long. Many social media platforms will automatically do this for you or uh, technologies like Bitly will shorten a URL for you, but it will still be something that's short and that people don't really recognize in terms of characters. So you can use other types of shorteners. We have our own at Esri so that you can actually name the URL with something that makes sense. So in this case, that map that I was, that story map that I was showing you before has been shortened to esriurl.com slash AGU social so that you know something about uh, what that map, that story map is supposed to represent. Another technology that I really love and really can't do social media without now, particularly on, well, for Twitter is TweetDeck. Uh, TweetDeck is an app, a free app uh, that runs best in the Chrome web browser. 
and you can see uh, many columns here that allow you to get a better idea of your whole social media landscape in one one glance rather than just dealing with uh, Twitter itself using Twitter's native app. So here you can see that I have some of my one of my tweets is scheduled. I have our webinar today uh, that's part of uh, a column of mentions and there are other uh, lists that I follow. And speaking of lists, I wanted to share also that you can make your own lists on Twitter so that you can, it's a way of following people or following organizations or accounts without actually following them. And Twitter never uh, really keeps track of this very well. Uh, you may follow certain people by clicking follow on their Twitter uh, home page, but you can also follow them a different way by putting their account in a list that Twitter will maintain for you. So I have lists that are other people in Esri uh, that I know about, Esri folk, people who are ocean advocacy accounts that I really admire, uh, all the Leopold fellows, and then also I follow the AGU SciComm or the AGU Sharing Science account in its own column. Uh, within within TweetDeck, so that is uh, a, a list. I really enjoy doing that. Another bit of technology that we all know is uh, hashtags. We can get kind of carried away with hashtags, and it's a good idea to practice with them so that you know, so that you're not overwhelming your your social media message with all of these hashtags. Uh, you see it quite a bit in Instagram. So these this is an Instagram example on the left, which they're, they're showing two very nice, simple hashtags here. And then on the right is one of my favorite people, Cersei Verba, that I follow on Instagram because she does a lot with uh, Lego minifigs like I do. And um, she has a whole bunch of hashtags here, and that works very well in Instagram. But one of the things you might want to do is to put all of your hashtags in a in an email browser or a Word doc or something that's easier for you to type in and then cut and paste that at the end of your social media post. And that really that really helps, especially if you're dealing with that, uh, with hashtags typing on a phone. Another thing that you can do is you can elevate an article or a blog. At Esri, we use uh, Elevate, which is part of LinkedIn, and it will give you several posts that you can then uh, reshare. And it, it actually shares that post out to an even broader uh, universe of people. And when you elevate something like that, or if, even if you retweet something, it's really good to put your own perspective in there. Don't just, don't just share it uh, without any context. It's really good to add that context. And these tools, these technologies also sometimes will have this where you can share according to the best time of day, uh, for your particular your particular network, so it does that uh, really well. You can switch between media. So oftentimes I like to uh, take something that I found in Instagram and post it uh, onto Twitter or onto Facebook. So don't just keep it in that that world. Put it into those other worlds. Uh, oftentimes colleagues will write with something that they would like for you to post on social media. And you can do that, but you're more likely to do it if they've actually written out what the tweet is. So like a ready-made tweet. In this case, a colleague was writing about the recent IPBES global assessment that we're all hearing about, which has the horrible news that we're likely going to lose a million species. Uh, they're at the risk of, of extinction because of human activities. Uh, he actually put together a tweet here uh, a guidance so that we can actually retweet or send our own tweet to send this perf this very important message out. So ready-made tweets are also uh, really important. As you can see from my heading here, I'm now moving from technology to best practice. And some of the things that I've learned, uh, again, in terms of email, people will send you some wonderful things via email. And I always try to make a practice of that now to tweet that out or send it out into Facebook or other media so that it has a, a, better, a better chance of being picked up. Another best practice is dealing with imagery. 
So it's really good to send words. It's even better to send words along with a picture. A picture is worth 280 characters. This is a picture of a cover of a book that's coming out very soon. And the image almost speaks for itself. In fact, when we put this out as a tweet or as a posting on Instagram, we just said this book coming to a bookstore near you. And we got so much uh, response because of the compelling uh, cover. And uh, people really like that. Another way to do well with an image is that you can put all the information in the image almost to the point where you don't really need to add very much text. This is an image about an upcoming meeting, Canadian Oceans Forum. It's got the date, it's got the location, uh, and you can also put uh, a web address within an image as well and uh, send that out. This is a, a very nice uh, series of uh, pictures that came from a website. So oftentimes it's good to do screen snapshots or to, to capture uh, the thing that you'd like to uh, tweet about. So if you want to tweet about a website, uh, capture some imagery from the website or from a report. This is from a National Academy of Sciences report. And it's such a compelling image about the different ways that we observe the ocean that it almost uh, speaks for itself. Another good practice is to know your audience, because oftentimes what is appropriate for Twitter may not be appropriate for Facebook or Instagram. Uh, especially these days, many things have a political tinge to them. So this is something that I put out on Twitter, but I only put it out on Twitter because my Twitter followers are more uh, politically active. They're in a more, uh, they, they like, they seem to like things that are somewhat uh, controversial. So this is an article that says the Trump administration's policies are fueling the extinction crisis. So uh, that went over well on Twitter. It would not go over well on LinkedIn, I don't think. Wash, rinse, repeat. Uh, it's okay to tweet something uh, repeatedly, daily, weekly, monthly, so that you can get the word out about something, such as what AGU Sharing Science and AGU did for our webinar today. And finally, one of the most enjoyable things for me on social media is live tweeting. Uh, hopefully, many of you or most of you have experienced this where you're at a, a session, you're at a meeting, uh, you're allowed to, to tweet and to take pictures and to get the word out almost in real time. And so a lot of people enjoy that. They enjoy doing it. They enjoy following it. But if you do live tweet, one of the things I've learned now is to capture that and archive it so that you can go back to it. There used to be a technology called Storify to do that. I now use Wakelet. And so all of my live tweets uh, from events now are uh, compiled in these nice little uh, catalogs. It's one web page each, and it talks about what happened while I was live tweeting at a particular event. So I just wanted to, to share these uh, tips with you. And I see by my timer, I'm at 18 minutes. So I'm going to close now. This is where you can uh, get more information from me by email and by social media. And if you want this portion of my slides, uh, they're at this URL that has been shortened for you. OK, thanks so much. And I'm going to uh, pass on now to my great colleague, Tashiana. All right, thanks so much, Don. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to share some of my insights with you all about kind of the science communication outreach and science policy activities I've been involved in. And so let's see. Okay. So um, I am a fourth year PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And so I'm, I'm early on in the kind of uh, research training and uh, professional side of things. And so I wanted to share that perspective with you all. Um, I'm actually a, an AGU Voices for Science advocate. Um, and I went through the uh, training that we had for that during its first year in 2018. And that really helped me uh, in different ways to prepare for science communication, outreach, and policy efforts. And so that has been really helpful for me. Um, some of what I do, so I do the science side of things, um, and what I, 
am involved in at Scripps is um, I'm working within the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes. And we do a lot of hydrometeorology where we study these extreme rain and snow events that affect the Western US, but also other regions of the world. And those are called atmospheric rivers. Um, and just briefly, they are um, these rivers in the sky, essentially um, water vapor plumes that form in the lower troposphere due to these unique ocean atmosphere interactions. And then once they hit land, you can see in the moving image on the bottom um, left that once they make landfall, they actually uh, can provide quite a bit of water rain in the form of rain and snow for um, the western US and other regions where they impact the area as well. Um, and then in addition to the science side, I'm really interested and, and try to um, remain dedicated to communication, outreach, and policy efforts. And so um, just to kind of think about, you know, what really drives me and actually my science and, and outside of my science, because, you know, we are human beings, we, we have other interests and, and kind of goals and things that motivate us. Um, I have this quote by Dr. Cornell West, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, back in 2012. And he says, we've forgotten that a rich life consists fundamentally of serving others, trying to leave the world a little better than you found it. We need the courage to question the powers that be, the courage to be impatient with evil and patient with people, the courage to fight for social justice. In many instances, we will be stepping out on nothing and just hoping to land on something. But that's the struggle. To live is to wrestle with despair, yet never allow despair to have the last word. So this is something that I, I try to keep in mind in the work that I do. Um, I think, you know, what can I do in service of others and of the community? You know, we're all in this world together and um, there's no one size fits all answer to how we can uh, help in our own unique ways, but there are creative ways that we can contribute. So some things uh, I just wanted to focus on first are things that actually kind of can hold uh, some of us back, especially as maybe early career professionals, um, maybe minorities, women in the field. Um, and one of those things for me and a lot of others that I've, I've discussed is, you know, this idea of not feeling like enough of an expert. And this can hold us back from wanting to share our science with broader audiences and um, also having this fear of, of criticism from others both outside and within our, our own field. And so I try to challenge these fears that I have um, while also learning from both the positive and negative experiences that I have in actually practicing my skills in communicating and doing um, kind of science policy efforts. And in fact, as students and kind of young researchers and training early career professionals, we have really unique opportunities to actually contribute to change and empower others who may be uh, earlier on in their career. So the mindset that I go into these situations with is more that I share what I've learned and what's important to me so far through my experiences. And just thinking about that, it's a journey and we're in this together. So there's always something to learn. There's always something to take from experiences, whether they're positive or negative. And so I'm, I'm going to be including a lot of photos of just personal experiences. Um, and so on the right, you can see at the top, this was a recent visit to Mississippi. Actually, last week I was in central Mississippi uh, with my partner and we went to his alma mater, uh, his high school, actually. And when we left the school, um, after speaking with the students about kind of the science we do and, he, and engineering that we do, um, the students told their teacher, you know, we're, that we're actually cool nerds. So that was kind of a fun piece of um, information that we heard after, afterwards. So that just shows kind of by um, being in this position of being maybe younger earlier on in our careers, we're able to connect with these students in high school in a different way. And also uh, a lot of the students were able to kind of open up with us and ask us more personal questions that I'll talk a little bit more about in the next um, slide as well. And then another way that as kind of younger professionals, earlier career professionals, we can actually contribute to changes 
uh, making a statement. Uh, so when I was in uh, Poland in actually December for the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, I was there as a delegate for um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And we shared about our research on atmospheric rivers and also kind of what we're expecting with extreme weather events in a changing climate. And I feel like just by being there, by um, showing the, our presence and having a presence from the US um, shows that, you know, although we don't necessarily have the, the national leadership in these areas, there are many of us who are really dedicated to finding solutions and working toward um, kind of being part of the change. And in addition to that, some of us happen to be women. So I was really excited to team up with other, other young women on these issues. So something else uh, that I think is important to discuss is, is vulnerability and candor. So in my experiences in sharing science, I found that you know, we can talk, we can talk about the details of the science and, and that can be really important, but also the idea of sharing our struggles, um, sharing our path and what, what it took to get there can, you know, end up encouraging maybe one person in the room, one young student, uh, or it could end up inspiring a whole lot more than just one person. So you never know um, when you're, doing these type of outreach activities, for example, how sharing your personal story could uh, make a difference. And in addition, there, there was a recent study um, showing that vulnerability actually helps build a stronger team. So it helps by building trust within that team. So when you're doing these types of maybe outreach or communication activities, I'd really challenge you to try opening up more for somewhat of a more personal discussion and, and allowing for questions that are similar to some of the ones I recently had when I was in Mississippi, like how do you choose which people you surround yourself by and how did you pay for school? These are questions that we don't often think about, um, you know, now being in a place where maybe we're, we're into our, our research a bit or in our PhDs and we've gone through certain battles already, but, um, these are the things that sometimes can help inspire. And okay, so, oops, I think the slides kind of went back a bit. Okay, thank you. And so um, I'm very interested in actually kind of targeting efforts um, to focus on um, this certain age group of kind of middle school age children, but also um, those younger and older. And one of the reasons is we lose a lot of girls who are interested in STEM when they're in middle school. Um, so on this slide, I just wanted to show that um, although, you know, children are young and they haven't had quite as many experiences necessarily, they can help change uh, par their parents' minds about climate change and really make a difference in the kind of climate change uh, conversations. There was a recent study that just came out on May 6, actually, um, that showed that fathers and conservative parents had the biggest change in attitudes on climate change after their children were um, done with lessons on climate change and actually shared it with their parents. And it turns out that daughters were more effective than sons in shifting parents' views. So I found that really interesting. And this just goes to show kind of the power and that the youth have and, and why it's important for us to um, also consider them in, in this conversation. So now our, I'll be sharing some um, kind of lessons that I've learned through my experiences. And um, these are things that I've been focused on, kind of putting my efforts into, but also things that I still want to grow in and continue developing. And so the first is kind of sharing with the youth, um, with young children from elementary school all the way up to actually uh, undergraduates. 
And so one of the things I've learned is if giving a presentation, if it's a, a slide format, keep it less than 20 minutes, um, except for if it's a college lecture, then sometimes you have more time to go into detail and, and um, actually teach the information a bit more. And then to limit text and unnecessary jargon, and overall focus on just a couple key points and provide visuals that are clear. Um, and, and this is a really important one is to reserve time for questions and almost kind of like protect this time because you really want to save that time for connecting with the students and um, maybe even having a discussion if that ends up being helpful. So kind of fight that urge to go into your finer details on the subject and, and focus on reserving time for the students. And also, it can be a really fun and great idea to consider including an activity or experiment. Um, I actually had done a tornado in a bottle with students and um, some experiments at uh, an amusement park in Maryland where they had a science day STEM, kind of like a STEM day fair type event. Um, and then learning about static electricity by bringing balloons and kind of like rub, having this, the students rub them on their hair and see how, you know, static electricity kind of works. And so I find that if you make it fun, it's really memorable for the students and they're pretty likely to go home and tell, you know, tell their friends about it, tell their mom and dad about it, their siblings, and, and that can make more of a difference than I think uh, we might realize. So uh, in addition to speaking with younger children and the youth, uh, I've also been practicing really sharing with the politically minded um, delegates and, and people in office. And some of the training through the uh, AGU Voices for Science um, program helped me kind of prepare for these experiences. I also was uh, involved in the American Meteorological Society summer policy colloquium last summer and um, we spent about 10 days in DC really learning more the ins and outs of how uh, science can be used to help inform policy but also the policy that helps or drives um, science the science that we do so it kind of goes both ways and that was a really great opportunity so um, in in these experiences, I've learned um, to really try to focus on what delegates or whoever you're speaking to uh, value or what their concerns are um, and or focus on what their constituents might value. And that might be a little bit different than their personal values. But if their goal is something like getting reelected or having support from the community, then you want to consider what their constituents actually value. And um, part of that, you know, takes some homework uh, beforehand and maybe reading about ways that they've, you know, voted in the past or issues that they've stressed um, before or, or things that they're kind of firm about that that maybe you could find a way to um, address. And then also when you if you're going to visit um, these delegates go going to their offices. Uh, oftentimes you end up meeting their staff members, um, maybe instead of the actual representative. And sometimes these staff members, they are fairly young, um, college aged, but don't let that fool you in that, you know, they spend a lot of time on these issues. And so treat meeting the staff members as a way to also reach the representatives. The information that you share with these staff members will be passed on to the representatives and if you can make it a kind of memorable experience and kind of get the staff member excited about what you're focused on um, that could uh, that could also translate over to the representative and i found that it's okay that you're not an expert in politics to kind of remind yourself you're there to share what you do know and uh, to try to make a difference even if it's in a small way uh, to try to make to try to contribute to some change or some action, some political action. So how I have been going about it is to kind of start with the value or the impacts, kind of why is, 
what you're saying important and how does it affect uh, how does it affect that community you're interested in and then explain a bit but be very concise emphasize or reiterate key points and then go for an ask if you have an ask um, which would be maybe something like um, we'd like to see an increase in funding for graduate education at uh, the University of California, for instance, and, and maybe there's a certain amount that you're asking and you share how your research actually helps uh, the community and how maybe it brings, it, it gives back to the community, in fact. And so I recommend to have kind of a two minute version of this um, kind of elevator pitch and then a little bit of a longer one, a few minutes. And you can always elaborate if needed, but don't get stuck on the finer details because they're very busy people and, and it's important to kind of get your key points across. And you can always leave visuals or a summary sheet that can be passed on to the representative or something fun that they could even give to their grandchildren. I've noticed that can be helpful as well. And then on the day to day, also just don't under, underestimate the actual power that you can have by speaking with people in your community, um, you know, on an airplane ride, a lift ride or, or throughout your neighborhood. So for World Oceans Day, I have some ideas on, on how you could get involved and how you can share your scientific and creative voice on some of these issues and on ocean and climate action. Uh, I think all of us, are, our voice matters and it's important that we connect with others about it. Um, the people in your community, they are voters, you know, the children, they are future voters and they also can help uh, bring some of these issues to adults. And so these are just some ways that uh, maybe you could think about getting involved organizing or participating in an event where you write to or visit policymakers, a beach cleanup. And then a big thing for me, which is really important, it has been really important and that I like to focus on and, and bring up are these 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And they're kind of goals that would um, help transform our world and make it a better place. So things like no poverty, working towards no poverty, zero hunger, some social justice issues, um, you know, equality for all. And also um, if you see number 13 is climate action, 14 is life below water, 15 life on land. These are things that we can address in not only the science that we do, but in, in the community efforts that we do. So. I would encourage you to um, kind of look up more information about the sustainable development goals. And I do have a link that I could hopefully pass along afterwards on ways that you could map out how your family or organization or even your whole community could contribute to these goals. Um, and then again, referencing back to the Sharing Science website, uh, that is really helpful in giving tips on, on how you can approach um, visiting delegates or writing to them and um, speaking with others about the science that you do. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, well, thank you both so much for that wonderful uh, webinar and sharing your uh, terrific uh, information and experience with us. Um, we want to encourage all of you who are on this webinar and those who will be listening to it to Share what you do if you're engaged. Uh, Kelly, do you want to tell a little bit here about this? Yeah, sure. So uh, we actually have um, some small, first, some small grants um, for about $1,000 each uh, to help support any events, outreach, and engagement activities that you might be um, thinking about for World Oceans Day, um, which you can find at centennial.agu.org. Um, but you'll also see us pretty active on the day on social media um, with the hashtags AGU100 and World Oceans Day. Um, and if you receive some of our mailings like AG Universe, you'll be able to see some of the stuff that's going on from our organization. But we'd also so love to make sure that we're resharing and promoting the stuff that you all might be thinking about or working on. So please let us know um, your ideas um, on social by using the hashtags on your screen. Um, but also, if you have questions about the grants that I mentioned, um, 
like I said, you can go to centennial.agu.org. Um, we'll also provide you some links um, in our follow-up. Yeah. And I encourage all of you, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, you know, follow us and follow Tashana and Dawn on all of the social media. Um, you know, we try to share a lot of really great stuff, as do they. Um, so you can both learn from example with them and also just learn more about opportunities and what's going on um, in the science communication and policy and so on realm at AGU. And I hope that if you're not already a member of the Sharing Science community, uh, formerly called the network, but we feel community is a little more welcoming. Um, and that's really what we aim for with it, is to build a community for those who are interested in doing science communication, to be able to contact each other and receive support from each other as well as from us. Please consider joining. Uh, we'd love to have you. We don't inundate you with any kind of um, messages. There's just a once a month newsletter. You get an online platform that you can communicate on. And it helps us know who you are so that we can reach out to you with opportunities as well. And then, um, so we have a handful of questions for uh, Dawn and Tashiana. Uh, so first one, um, it's actually, there's a couple on social media. So we'll just kind of lump these together. But one is, um, do you have to be on all these social media platforms to be effective um, if management of all of them is difficult? Um, how do you only choose a few? Uh, and then kind of with that, like, you, so you're on it, is there a danger of like going down a rabbit hole or spending huge amounts of time doing it? Um, Don, I'll kick it to you first and then Tashiana if you want to add anything after. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Shane, and thanks for that very important question. Uh, the it is really overwhelming to uh, deal with all of the various social media platforms. Uh, there are a lot of people who are effective uh, just on one. In fact, I was uh, speaking with uh, Jane Zelikova recently. She's one of the founders of 500 Women Scientists. If you've heard about that amazing uh, science communication and activist organization, and she focuses primarily on Twitter. There is um, a community that's known as Science Twitter, uh, and uh, many of us just stick to Twitter. Uh, because I work in a couple of different realms, uh, academia, uh, from the standpoint of science, but also in industry, and also with a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations, um, my work, I think, is most effective if I can spread out to other um, media that, uh, for instance, industry is really focused on LinkedIn. They're, they're not as, um, many of them are not as active on Twitter, so, so I try to, to spread myself across several of them. And then Instagram is just plain fun, so <laughs> I have a lot of personal things on Instagram. Uh, to the second part of your question, it is absolutely easy to go down a rabbit hole. And it's one of those things that requires balance and discipline and uh, reminders to yourself, just like other aspects of your professional and personal life. Sometimes you have to dial it back a bit. And some of the things that I uh, enjoy doing, like building Legos or going mountain biking or road biking, I do not have any electronics with me. I completely disconnect and just let the social media and the other parts of the world go. So so it, it is uh, all in balance. Thanks. And I guess just quickly to add to that, um, again, about the balance and um, being kind of early on in, in the research side of things and in my career, I also think about, you know, I still I still am really focused on um, establishing myself as a, a scientist in other ways. And so I am cautious about that. But at the same time, um, there is there is a way to do it where, you know, you can limit it to a certain number of platforms. I primarily use Twitter for um, science communication, but I also sometimes use Facebook and um, LinkedIn. Um, so I think that it's important to kind of think about the audience that you'd like to reach and what you can do kind of quickly. 
um, without it drawing too much away from the other work that you're doing. But keeping in mind that it is still important to hear for for the world to hear your voice. Um, and so if you feel so inclined, you know, it's it's OK to do so. Thank you both so much. Um, and just uh, on our end at AGU, specifically sharing science, we have a bunch of resources uh, specifically on the use of social media. Um, what platforms are right for you based on what you want to do, um, how much time, messaging, all sorts of things. So we'll make sure to include um, links to all of that in our follow-up. Uh, another question we have, um, and this is for either or slash both of you, uh, how do you view the intersection between public outreach and education and pushing for policy change? What strategies are similar and different between those two goals? So I guess I'll, I'll jump in uh, uh, really quickly and then pass on to Tashiana again. So at the education and public policy, I'm uh, it, so it's it's really nice that you've got a perspective from me who's been around for a while and Tashiana who is uh, just beginning her career. And I think for, for both ends of the spectrum, the education uh, and the policy is absolutely critical now. Uh, I, I hope that as many of us as possible will feel comfortable and empowered to to participate in both realms. And this is where AGU Sharing Science and other programs are so very, very valuable because they already provide uh, wonderful guidance for you to, to help you uh, get jump-started uh, into both of those realms. One of the things with policy, though, is I think many of us operate from the standpoint of informing policymakers and providing uh, very useful information, especially to staff. I noticed that in Tashiana's, one of Tashiana's slides, great point to uh, work with the staff of Congress people and uh, senators, uh, because that's where the rubber meets the road. But in doing that, not to uh, actually create policy, uh, which which is out of the realm of science. We, we, we are not policymakers, but we want to inform policymakers. And then there is the trend now of more scientists who are running for public office. You know, that's, that's another angle on this as well. And I think for, for our science colleagues who are doing that, uh, that is also a wonderful development. Yeah, and I think also the, the way when I'm kind of doing um, education type efforts versus uh, public policy, there are there are quite a bit of similarities in my approach, surprisingly, um, or maybe not surprisingly, but um, the idea kind of of focusing on my key points, they end up being maybe tailored a little bit um, for each audience. But um, thinking about the values, the interests, and also maybe, you know, the, the experience and background of the audience members, ultimately. Um, and just also thinking about that, you know, the, the world is changing, and it might actually be a better time for us as earlier uh, career professionals or early, uh, younger researchers to actually um, be involved in the kind of public policy and outreach side of things. It's a lot more, I would say, accepted and encouraged. Um, and AGU and, and the American Meteorological Society, for instance, they kind of uh, allow for additional training and, and this platform where, as now an AGU Voices for Science advocate, I have, I have kind of a, a title and a platform on which to do the work that I'm interested in, in addition to the science that I do. And that has been very helpful. Thank you both so much. Um, we have time for probably like one more question. And so this is maybe a little bit more general one, maybe one we should have started with. But 
um, not everyone listening or not everyone out there who uh, is doing research is also doing communication outreach policy work, but maybe they want to. So I guess from each of you, do you have kind of one nugget of advice on for someone who's never done anything and might be hesitant or overwhelmed, or whatever it might be, like what's What's the best way or how, I guess, maybe did you start and any suggestions there? Well, I, I think for me, it started with an event like World Oceans Day. So Tashiana's uh, tips for participation in World Oceans Day specifically, I think, are fantastic for someone who's never done anything in communication, science communication. For me, it started with GIS Day, which is a which still is an international event. And I went and talked to fifth graders uh, as a doctoral student. And that opened up an entire world to me. And uh, once I survived talking to fifth graders, I think I was set for just about any audience. <laughs> so uh, I think it's important just to get started with, with one event or one issue and then go from there. Yeah, and I think um, just going back to thinking about thinking about it maybe a little bit differently instead of you know i need to share this really complicated um, science or this information it's it's more for me thinking about i i want to share something that i've been learning and when i think of it that way it's a lot less intimidating and um, it allows also for room for growth so I can um, kind of learn from that experience afterwards. But um, when I go into the experience or the, the opportunities that way, I kind of, um, it allows me to be more kind of calm about things and, and be able to really share the main points. I kind of got started um, sharing with younger students as well, I would say, um, doing outreach. I, I actually volunteered um, to visit my younger cousin's classroom. And I think at the time they were in um, third grade and, and fourth grade. And so visiting the classroom and just sharing experiments and um, information with the children was really great. And you can really build on that afterwards. Like, okay, what worked, what didn't work? Um, maybe next time I can do this or, or try something a little bit different. Great, thank you both so much. Um, so that's about all the time we have. Um, thank you so much to Don and Tashiana for sharing their work with us today. Um, like I said, we'll send out an email probably next week or so with a link to the recording, a bunch of follow-up stuff. And if you at any time, any of you out there listening, watching, have any questions for us at AGU, um, you can see where to find us. And please be sure to follow Don and Tashiana wherever you can find them. Uh, they are wonderful resources. Um, so thank you all again, and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.